everyone. We are going to walk through the code for the stock portfolio optimization application. So we're looking at this uh, VBA application. It's pretty involved. It has lots of different uh, tabs that we have um, gone through in the previous session. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to walk through the code behind the scene. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the visual basic area. I have already uh, put in a few stops where we're going to uh, look at the code more closely. You can see that most of the code is in the explanation sheet. Um, there are several different uh, subs and we'll go through uh, them in detail. Uh, most of the sheets are empty, like behind the scenes. So the code is primarily in explanation. There is also a little bit of code in uh, the user form. So I'm going to take a look at that. And then at the end, I'll come back to this workbook. So um, in the user form, if you come over here, you'll see that the user form basically only does one thing, it allows the user to select the companies. Um, so this is how we get the user choices. The user can multi-select. Um, so you can look at the user form. There are lots of different um, settings that you can choose over here. And uh, um, this form allows you to select multiple um, companies. And we can go behind the scene to do look at this. Okay, so there are actually two little subs over here. So the first one is the OK button, the event handler click uh, for clicking. Uh, we'll actually calculate, um, we'll, we'll count the number of stocks that the user has selected. So uh, basically this uses a for loop to go down the list, um, look at the list in, um, index, to see if it's true or not. So if the um, the list index is selected, then we increment the uh, stock number count by one. So after this for loop, we can determine how many stocks have been selected. And if the user has selected only one stock or zero stock, then uh, we generate a message asking the user to do that again. Uh, but if the user has uh, selected more than two stocks, then we just make the user form go away. Now, here's a little sort of nifty um, function that we have built for double clicking. So if you double click the form and you can try it, basically it will um, by default, select Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, BAC, I don't know what this is, and Cisco. Um, so these five companies will be uh, selected by default if you just double click. That way you don't have to actually manually select anything. So this portfolio will be put together by default. So pretty cool. Now let's go to the explanation worksheet. Um, this is what happens when you click on the button, Compute uh, Efficient Frontier. So that's on the explanation sheet over here. So if you look, go to explanation, this button, Compute uh, Efficient Frontier, when this but the user clicks this, this triggers the entire model. Um, so all that code is behind the scene over here. So we have a bunch of um, variables that we have declared over here. The first thing we do is to get the user's choices. So we show the user form, and then with the user form, we um, can capture the number of stocks that has been selected. And then these stocks are then put into these two dynamic arrays, one for the ticker symbols and the other one for the stock name. And so you go down the list. And if the selection is true, which is uh, the row index for that particular list, if it's uh, selected, which is a true, um, gives you a true Boolean uh, return value, then we will uh, inc increment the count and we actually add this ticker symbol, so row index 
and then column zero. So column the this is a list box that has two columns, column zero and column one. So column zero gets stored into the ticker symbol array. And then um, the column one, which is the company name, gets uh, stored into the stock name array. So you can see that these are actually this these are dynamic arrays. So initially they their size were not specified, but um, we did um, already count the number of stocks when we uh, ran the user form. We already counted the number of stocks. And so that number has been stored into this property of the user form stocks. And then we can uh, directly access that value. So we know exactly how many stocks there, there is. And then we resize the dynamic arrays to accordingly, according to how many stocks the user has selected. Okay, uh, before we do anything, we wanna clear the contents from the return um, sheet. And then we wanna update the status bar. Okay, so this is just show the status bar and making sure that it's ready to go for every requested stock. So depending on how many the user had chosen, let's say if there are five, then we'll create five new temp query sheets. So these are temporary sheets that will show up during the run of the program, but then after it's over, these um, sheets will actually get deleted. So um, iStock is a number that goes from one to the number of stocks. So we'll just iterate through um, each stock and then we update the status bar. So you will see on the status bar that we're running web query for this particular um, ticker symbol. And then we, um, when we do that, we basically just go through the, um, the query, the web query. So we have done this already, so I'm not going to go into detail. This is the same as the last um, exercise where we ran um, the web query from Alpha Vantage. Okay, so we can take a peek at the code, but it's basically the same thing. So run uh, query is over here. It's um, going to We get the stop query data from this query. Okay, so there's a web address that we put together based on the user's query. So depending on what stock we want, and then we will actually download the entire data set, which is a CSV file into a single string text variable. And then we look for the error message um, phrase and the code, hopefully there's no error message, then you can go ahead and be successful. Otherwise you would generate an error message. So if the web query is successful, then we will go through this bunch of code to parse the data and then uh, print everything in onto the temporary query form for that particular, um, for that particular um, stock. We actually specify the upper level, uh, upper left uh, corner of the uh, the uh, area. Okay. Oh, this is after actually. This is after you've uh, printed everything. So this is the end of printing all the stock data. Okay. So you loop through every line of the CSV file, and then you process every word, and then you extract all the ver uh, values and print them onto the temporary query sheet. So once that's done, then we calculate the percentage price increase from the previous day. Um, so you will actually get the, the upper left corner and the lower right corner. So the, this actually just specified the range in which we'll print the um, uh, the price uh, change, price increase or decrease. So this is really price change, okay, from the previous day. So it could be a positive or a negative change. So what we do is we actually specify a formula for this area, right? So we say um, this is the formula. And the first record begins in the second row, which is R1. 
Okay, R1 is just um, whatever the current position is, you will go down one row. So R is for row and C is for column. And one means you're going down one row. So in the second row, okay, not the first row. And then three columns to the left, meaning C minus three. So this is going left, three columns. Okay, and column F contains this, this uh, three columns to the left is column F, and column F contains the closing price. Okay, so what do you highlight this so we can, uh, and the closing price is close. Okay, so it's labeled as close. Percentage increase is the first day price, which is this area, uh, RC3, this one. Okay, is current row, but then three columns to the left minus the second day. Okay, so this is the first day, and this is going down one row, staying in the same column, column F, but going down one row. So this is tomorrow, this is today and tomorrow. So basically you say today minus tomorrow's price divided by today's price is the, that is the definition of percentage increase. And then we apply the same formula to the entire upper left to lower right region. So you copy the um, formula and apply to everybody. And then we move the returns. So this is all calculations on the temporary query sheet. Um, and then we move these, we copy them to the return sheet. Um, you will have to get the appropriate column offset to move to. So this is like figuring out the first stock um, if you have the first stock, you will get the data. If not, um, you will do some offsets over here. So it's a lot of detail code to try to just do in a lot of copy and pasting. So after the run query, you have actually this, uh, this run query uh, subroutine uh, download stock price using web query, but it also copies, well, it actually... calculates uh, returns, daily returns. Okay, all right. So going back to run query. So if we run the query, the stock uh, data was downloaded successfully and returns were created successfully, um, then we'll move on. But if it's not successful, then, you know, we have some code to handle the failures. This is the same as what we saw last week. Um, so I'm just going to skip these. Um, this, there's also some fancy code to limit the uh, queries to five queries per minute. Um, and asking Excel to wait if um, there's more than five queries per minute because um, you may experience some overload. You know, you want to avoid overloading your computer. So we just have a little timer um, to pause the program if, um, if there's too much going on. Okay. And uh, if the web query completed successfully, then we'll create and run the model. So you can create this model. So we'll call. So this is a function that we call. And then we call another function to calculate the efficient frontier. And then lastly, we call the function to update the chart. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and look at these three functions very quickly. So create model is all about going to the model uh, sheet. So let's just remind ourselves of what the model sheet looks like. The model sheet looks like this. So the model sheet is really set up for the solver model. It's an optimization model. What you want to do is you want to constraint, right? So you have some constraints. You have um, portfolio variants. I actually moved um, all the notes to the very right. So you need to scroll right if you want to see some documentation. But basically, um, we have objective function, we have weights that we're trying to um, change these values, okay? And then we have these constraints, okay? So the constraints, okay, this is the constraint, this is the target, the objective that we're trying to minimize. 
And so these things all have to be programmed into solver. So you can see solver over here, but we actually specify these in, at runtime as well. So I'll show you how these are done dynamically in the code. Um, so the weights are what we, the numbers we're trying to change in order to um, get the optimization uh, models. Okay. So, uh, so this is the model when we create the model. So we have to create this model uh, on the fly because we do not always just choose these two stocks. Sometimes we choose five. Sometimes we chose choose twenty. And we need a dynamic way to create the, the weights uh, matrix and also the covariance matrix. Um, so all these have to be changed dynamically. And so that's what the VBA code is for, is for creating this model dynamically. So you'll see that we clear all the old results and then we're going to build a new summary. Um, so the means and a covariance arrays for the newly selected portfolio by going through each model. Okay, so we have a for loop to go through each model. Um, and we uh, sort of artificially set the initial weights for the portfolio to be one divided by the number of stocks. That way, uh, all the initial weights are the same for all the uh, stocks and also they add up to one. So it's very important that one of the constraints is that the weights have to add up to one. So if we give everybody the weight that is one divided by the number of stocks, then the weights will always add up to one. And then um, we specify the weights range. Okay, so all these offsets are specifying where the weights are, where the um, um, covariance matrices are going to be. And then we also find the minimum return and the maximum return. So we can you can do the range of means and then we can find the minimum and the maximum and then using that. So we'll do minimum plus maximum divided by two. This is the initial uh, mean return just for now. And then the solver program will um, try to change that value for us. OK, so this is our minimum requirement minimum plus maximum, then we'll change that number over time. So that is our requirement. And then we'll calculate the sum of the weights. We can simply create uh, some formula so that we can add the sum, like add the weights together. So it's a sum formula. And then we calculate the covariance matrix using Excel's covariance.x function. S is for sample. So we, because we have just a sample of stocks, we're not trying to estimate the population of all possible stocks. We're just looking at the sample of five or two. You know, it's basically a sample. It's a portfolio is a sample. Um, so we're using the sample version of the covariance command. Um, so we go through all the stocks. OK, and then we'll get we label the column. So these are the labels, label the columns and rows uh, with uh, ticker symbols. And then we go to the returns worksheet with each worksheet, we want to create the covariance matrix. OK, so we have a covariance matrix set, uh, set up using the covariance.s function. So you would just loop through each stock and you try to um, set the ranges and then put the covariance matrix um, covariance uh, dot s function in each of the cells. And then once we're done calculating all the covariance matrix, then we will specify the range of cells and name that as the uh, covariance range. That way we can use it uh, conveniently later when we're calculating, um, calculating um, the efficient frontier. So now this is the efficient frontier code. And then um, for each of the e 11 equally spaced values of the required mean portfolio return, we'll run the solver and then record the results on the Calculate Efficient Frontier Sheet. OK, 
okay, what is the calculate efficient frontier she? So this is basically a she where we have standard deviations. We have the minimum. So the minimum will change. So the initial minimum is basically the minimum return plus the maximum return by divided by two. So the average of the minimum and the maximum, but then we increment a little bit until we hit the maximum. Okay. And, uh, and these are the 11 runs. So each run, these are the weights for the two different stocks. Okay, so each run will generate different weight values that are optimized for your objective function. Um, okay, so if we go back, we'll see that um, the model she is still the active she. Recall that the she with the solver model must be active to run solver. So you should always make sure that the model she is active. Okay. The portfolio standard deviations and means are recorded in the first two columns, and the corresponding portfolio weights are recorded after one blank column. Okay, so we just saw that. And we are now sort of formatting the tables, creating some labels, and then we print a list of stock names. Um, and then what we do is we activate the model sheet and then we start to set up our solver. Okay, so the solver, first of all, uh, we're going to set up the solver um, configurations um, at runtime, meaning that we control all the configurations in this code. And so what we want to do is we want to say solver reset, which resets all previous settings and lets you start with a clean slate. And then solver, and then we run solver OK. So solver OK does three things. First of all, it identifies the objective cell. That's the portfolio variance. So we want to optimize the variance. We want to minimize this variance, right? So we also specify we want minimize or maximize. So we specify a max min value equal to this um, tell solver that you want to minimize this objective function. And then we identify the decision variable cells, which is weight. So that's what we specify over here by changing. Um, so we want to minimize the objective function by changing the values in the weights. Um, by changing the value of the weights range, okay? And then we also add a uh, new constraint. So we have three constraints we want to add. Um, we want the summary, um, the sum of the weights to be, um, they have to add up to, they have to be greater than zero, and also they have to add up to one, okay? So we can actually use the less than or equal to, equal to, so we have an equal to relation over here. So it has to be equal to one. So the formula text is one, right? And the mean return has to um, be three. So it's greater than, okay, required return. Okay, so the mean return has to be greater than require return. And then the last one is some of the weights has to be greater than zero. So it's greater than the relation is three because we want greater than or equal to. And then the formula of text is zero. Okay, so you can see that we use the relation uh, parameter one, two, three, five, four, six to specify the different um, types of constraints. So these are actually the options, the same options that you see when you use setup solver on the interface. And then we have a for loop to go through um, solver for 11 times. So every time you have a different required return. Okay, so the first time I run at zero, so this term is all zeroed out, so you just have the minimum return. But then the next round is going to be minimum return plus one tenth of the range. The range is from minimum to maximum. So you divide the range by 10 pieces. And so every time you just do like minimum return plus 10 percent, plus 20 percent and all the way to the maximum. Right. So um, that's basically the 11 runs. And then we call solver solve to uh, solve solver uh, to run the solver program. And then once this line is done, then you have the solver um, results and the results are in these ranges, right? So the standard deviation, require return, 
we want to save them into the efficient frontier program. And then we want to get the, the weights. Okay. So the weights are your results, and these are going to be stored into these offsets. So that's how we get that. This is where we get all the results in the uh, calculate efficient frontier worksheet. And then the last part is to update the scatter plot of the efficient frontier. This uh, updates the efficient frontier chart, okay, which is a scatter plot. So it has the, the x um, axis and the y axis, and they have minimums and maximums in the length. So you can set up the, um, the chart exactly how you want. Okay, so note that the chart um, is actually right here. So the efficient frontier is actually a chart object, and you can actually specify the uh, properties over here. And uh, we are going to select the efficient frontier star um, range. This range is on calculate, uh, calculate efficient frontier. So um, over here, you'll see that this is the efficient frontier star. So this area is basically the values that we're going to use for plotting this um, scatter plot. Okay, so we want to select that range uh, with the offset, uh, which is one row down. And in the same column, you want to resize to 11 and 2. So this is the area that's going to be the source of data. And then we specify the minimum, maximum, the length uh, based on the source range, and then we're good to go. And then we just update the, uh, the chart, and we use uh, source range as the input for this chart, and we specify, we um, configure the axis properly, and then we'll have a proper chart. Uh, we already talked about run query, so we are um, pretty much done going through. It's a pretty quick um, sort of overview of the code. There's a lot of details, but let's just do a quick run of the program and see if it's running as um, expected. So let's go ahead, and we're going to select two different... Um, yeah, let's just try to keep it easy and choose two other... Um, company so we can see how this runs. Okay, so if I select APP and then I select T for ATT, then we'll be able to do a, this is my portfolio of two companies. And then we'll see, um, you know what, let me undo this because I really want to select Bed Bath & Beyond. Okay, And then, oh, BAC is Bank of America. There we go. Uh, mystery solved. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, put together a portfolio of these two. So what the program is gonna do, remember, is gonna download um, a bunch of, um, well, the stock prices for these two companies from Alpha Vantage into, and then we'll create a temporary query form uh, worksheet for each one of them. So we have two, that means we'll have two query forms. And then once the query forms or uh, worksheets are put together, then they're used to calculate the returns and the returns will be copied to the returns uh, worksheet. And then the returns worksheet then will be used, uh, be fed into the model. And then the model results will be put together on Calculate Efficient Frontier. And then we have the final uh, visualization on Efficient Frontier. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. And you can see that we are now at, um, we're now ready to go through the um, list box. So this list box has 245 companies. Okay, so what we do is we go through the row index from zero to 244, because it starts with zero. So we'll go through each one of them and see which one is, um, selected. So most of them are not selected, right? But the ones that selected, um, so we can put it in here, we can put a stop here and we'll just go through. So now you can see row index uh, 17 
is selected. So uh, we're going to increment our stock count is now one. So it went from zero to one. And then we're going to put this company, APP, into our ticker um, array. And we're also going to put um, this company name called um, American Apparel into the stock name. Okay, so now you see how these two arrays are being used. Now I'm just going to run through this loop. Okay. Now you can see my array of stocks. So what happened to my ticker? Okay, so my ticker symbol I stock. The first one is, uh, is uh, well, the second one is BBBY now. So this is I stock of two. The first one was um, APP. So we have successfully figured out the two um, symbols that the user wants. So mean is actually the worksheet. Okay. So within the worksheet, because we set up the ticker symbol. So ticker symbol over here, stock name. These are public um, global variables for this worksheet. So they're actually um, specified. They're set up as property. So ticker symbol is actually a property of me. Me is this worksheet. Okay, so you can actually uh, expand me and you will see lots and lots of properties and ticker symbol and stock name are the two two of the many properties of me and so you can see stock symbol ticker symbol one is app and the second one is bbby okay so if you go down you should be able to find um stock where's my stock oh maybe it's going up this way so stock name is over here so stock name, first one is American Apparel, second one is Bed Bath & Beyond. Okay, very good. So now we are down to running uh, the query because we now know the two stocks and we are gonna run the query using the first stock, okay? And we're gonna see if it's successful or not. So we're gonna run and uh, so now it is coming back, okay? Um, the run was clearly successful, I believe. And uh, this is, we have gone through, this is successful, yes. So you can actually see the text um, um, that we have downloaded is actually a very long string of text um, with all 100 days of data for, so if you look at text, it's actually a very long, um, string that has the timestamp open price high low closing and the volume so what we are looking for is really the closing price so these are the numbers and we'll just continue to process these okay so all this data is processed character by character line by line um and stored properly into each column so now we will loop right now we just processed one line and we're going to go through the second line so what we're going to do is we're going to go back we'll get the second line and the second the line is basically you will loop until you get to the end you know, we've seen this last time so i'm just going to skip through and you will see the subtext is the next line which is the line of timestamp um i believe this is what open high low and then closing, and then this is the volume, okay? And so you will just keep doing this, and uh, these are now printed to the, um, I think the temporary query form. So we now have a temporary APP query form. Um, we have printed the first line of data, and then we'll just keep going. These, are, these numbers are, um, 
from yesterday, I believe, and then we'll just keep going this way. Okay, so let's go back to Visual Basic, and this will loop until the entire sheet is filled out. Okay, so if we now go back, you will see that the temp uh, app worksheet is completely filled out with 100 days of data. Okay. Uh, this is a little weird. The data is not quite right. Um, so something is wrong with the the um, the Alpha Vantage website. So you should. Look into this, you always look at your data set and make sure everything is correct, but it's a little weird that they have the same um, numbers for all the days. So now we're going to um, calculate the percentages. So we're going to specify the range that is the uh, upper low, um, the start data area, and then we're going to print, um, we're going to generate all the formulas. So that's what we have done here. So this is the formula. You can see the if statement. So if the number is, if it's a number, then we'll do F2 minus F3. So today minus tomorrow divided by today's price. And that will be your um, calculation for all these. Now, these numbers are zero because there's zero change. There, if there's changes, you will see um, different values over here. Okay. So that's just the first company, and then we'll go on to do the next company. Okay. So this is the second stock. We're going to run through it. And now the second spreadsheet is produced. So you can see Bed Bath & Beyond is much more normal. So we have some natural variations. The volume seem reasonable. These are large volumes. And then the closing price is used to calculate this. So this is calculated by dividing what well, we're looking for today versus yesterday. Well, um, this is today versus yesterday. So this is going backwards actually in history and uh, divided by today's number. So these are the return values. So all these returns from uh, APP and BBBY, these columns will then be copied to um, the return sheet. So you can see that we already have APP. Um, this is the dates. And now we're going to copy the Bed Bath & Beyond numbers here. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. Okay. So at this point, um, both columns are copied here. And uh, uh, we are back to the for loop, but we are actually done with both. So the number stock is two. We've done gone through both. So we are um, now actually going through um, each of the stock. I think we're now in the, let me see, the create model uh, sub already. So now we're going to start to create this model, which is by setting up the initial weights, right? So right now what we do when it's setting up this this sheet. So see how like they're all blank right now because we just cleared everything and these are not working properly, but we are in the process of setting up these initial numbers. So this is setting um, all the ways to be one divided by the number of stocks. We only have two stocks. So the initial weights are 0.5 and 0.5. Okay. So the first one is 0.5. The second one is also going to be 0.5. So we have set up the uh, weights and the means, okay? And then we're going to set up the covariance table. So this is the covariance matrix. We're going to insert all the covariance um, formula. So now we have the covariance formula over here. So this is the first covariance formula that's generated dynamically. And then we'll go through all of them. So at this point, the model has been set up. So all the uh, initial values are set up properly, and now we're ready to run solver. So once we run solver, the solver results will be copied over here to the uh, Calculate Efficient Frontier page. Okay, so we already have these uh, 11 runs. We'll go through each one of them. 
Um, so let's go ahead. We're going to reset the solver and then we're going to um, set up solver. So if we go back now and look at our solver, uh, oh, we can't really look at solver during one time. So we'll go back to our Visual Basic and we'll just continue to set up solver. So this solver, uh, as we talked about, we'll set up the constraints, we set up the objective function, and now we're going to run it for 11 times. So the first time, okay, the required return is just going to be the minimum return. So the minimum return is very little. You see this number. And then um, with nothing. So this will just equal the minimum. Okay, so the requirement right now is uh, probably print it over here. So the return in the model, so the, this is the minimum return. So we're going to run the solver using this minimum. Okay. And we're going to solve. Okay, so now we have solved this. Um, if you go back to the model, you'll see all these values. So the solver has actually just solved this uh, with these weights, one versus zero. Remember, we started with 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Now solver says with this minimum return, we should do 100% apparel and zero uh, Bad Bath & Beyond. Well, this model is going to be a little weird because uh, American apparel um, values did not change at all. Okay. So... Um, so we'll keep going. Now what we do is we copy the model results, the 0, 1 to the calculate um, to the spreadsheet. Okay, so we'll copy these numbers onto this sheet. Okay, so that's what we're doing right now. So we're doing copying, well, we're copying the standard deviation, the required return, uh, and now we're copying the weights, okay, the two weights. So now they're both copied here, the standard deviation and also the daily uh, minimum is uh, also uh, copied. And now we're just gonna do this for 11 times. Okay, so now all 11 runs, you can see that there's no variation because something strange happened with this stock. But you should see, actually, typically you will see different numbers. So um, what you do now is to uh, set up the chart. So we're going to update the chart. So right now the chart um, still has data from last run. Okay, so right now we actually don't have anything on the chart because we just cleared it. Um, however, we're going to set the range okay to be the source range is going to be efficient from to star um with 11 rows and two columns so that is going to be efficient uh from to star is over here actually so it'll be this area so we'll select that we specify the minimum is going to be the off uh, offset um, the second row, right? And uh, the maximum is going to be the last row. Minimum Y is going to be uh, the second column, right? First row, a uh, second row, first column, the next column, and the maximum is also going to be um, going to be the last row for the next column. And then the length of the axis are basically simple difference between the minimum and the maximum and then we'll update the chart now so once we update we should be able to see these values okay. so now if you go back to the chart you will be able to see that we have these proper labels the minimum the maximum the size the length of the axes are appropriate for the data range and now we're going to set the source okay so we're going to specify the source of the data which now is configured. Um, and then what we're gonna do is, we're just gonna run through the rest of the program to finish the chart. Now the chart is a little weird because of the 
weird nature of the data, but otherwise we are done with this program. One last thing I want to highlight is that if you go to this workbook, you will see what happens when we first open the workbook. So this is what happens when before you actually have seen anything, like during the process of opening the workbook, uh, the program actually goes through and delete all the temp query worksheets. So you won't see them the next time you run them. But at the end of this current run, you actually see all your temps. Um, that way you can inspect the values, figure out what's wrong, and then try again. But next time uh, when you open the worksheet, these will disappear. Okay, so that's what this is. Delete all these. Like you can just do this sheet that delete, and you'll be able to delete that worksheet. So that is all. It's a pretty ambitious program, has lots of moving parts, but uh, hopefully it's something that's very handy, useful, and um, uh, educational. So enjoy. I hope you get to explore the many different facets of the program and uh, learn a bunch of new skills and hopefully get inspirations for your final project. Thanks, everyone.